Um, this is a great opportunity for our small businesses um, to have an elected official that they can talk to and share their stories about what they've been experiencing during this pandemic. And I really, I know you're very busy, but I really appreciate the opportunity um, that you afforded us to have um, an opportunity to talk with you about this. So I'm going to, at this point, uh, turn it over to you. And as Representative McLean knows, I'm going to have to step out at 11 o'clock. Um, Brad Smith will um, be the host of this call and can manage any of the Q&A. And I think, Susan, you want to do a little bit of a sort of a preamble of what you've been doing, and then we're going to open it up to Q&A. Is that correct? That's perfect. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Well, um, good morning, and thank you very much for allowing me to be part of this today. I really appreciate it. And I just want to let you know that uh, I, I want to be here today primarily to listen to you. I also want to make sure that uh, if you have questions that we try to answer them here on the spot. If I can't answer them, I'll ask you to please send that question to my email, my official email at the state, and we will get back directly uh, to you with a more professional and uh, complete answer. So be happy to do that. Um, the last two months have been uh, really overwhelming and I think what I would consider to say uncharted. And I believe that as a representative, uh, we have spent as much time as we can uh, in the legislature to get as much information to our businesses and to our citizens as possible and also help them navigate both federal and state processes. And uh, I'm on the emergency board, and so we have met twice since this all started, once in March and once in April. And in April, we were able to give out uh, close to $32 million uh, to quite a few what we consider to be short-term, quick turnaround, important um, financial support that we could give. And we, the small business assistance was only 10 million because with the emergency board, we are, you know, we are held as 20 of the legislators to only be able to hand out a particular amount of money that's in that account without actually going back to a special session. And we were also able to give some work relief dollars uh, which amounted to another 10 million. And we also worked on some long-term care working and training and testing, which had to do with the health aspects of keeping our workers and folks safe as we were trying to navigate uh, all of the changes that were happening daily, uh, if not hourly, uh, especially in the first two to three weeks. My areas of, of concentration are uh, infrastructure, uh, which includes a lot of transportation issues as well as education. And so a lot of the work that I'm doing is around uh, both of those areas. The infrastructure really does interface with business and uh, with commerce and with a lot of the other elements that we're all facing in different ways today in the, in the last two months. And then I would like to tell you that uh, the committees that we're having that will be taking the place of May legislative days are happening uh, between May 22nd, and that's when the House will start working on our committees, and uh, we will be working on uh, any, all of the committees will get updates and reports. And then we also, then the Senate will start on, I believe it's going to be the first of of June and go to the 5th of June. And we have to extend it like that because we only have so much capacity of technology and we're trying to keep our workers safe as well. And so we can only do so many committees at a time and we are gonna be doing those remotely. And the work that we do during that committee time will really tell us um, specifically uh, how and when we're gonna be able to handle a successful special session. And as you know, because of constitutional issues, there are different ways for us to come into a special session. And the governor can call us into a special session or the Senate and the House together can call us into a special session. But there are different rules, there are different timelines, and there are different ways for those special sessions uh, to happen. And so it's all being worked out right now between the governor's office and the leadership of the legislature on specifically what we feel would be the most successful and would be the most, um, I guess I would say tight and making sure that we have everything that we need to handle uh, ready to go and, and keep it to a short session so that we, we don't uh, elongate something. We are not going to be able to go back and pick up everything from 2019 that wasn't passed. We will be concentrating on budget. 
We will be concentrating on COVID response. We will be making sure that we are dealing with the things that our businesses and our citizens need. And as I pointed out in education, I'm also part of that. And we have a great deal of work to be able to do for our higher education and our colleges and universities and community colleges, as well as our, our K through 12 and early education if we're going to get things back into reasonable shape uh, in the fall and September. But I will say without a doubt that uh, we are really working hard on trying to get things as Deanna and I were talking before the meeting going and keep it going and really keep responding to all of the differences. So I, I really don't have anything else that I wanna share at this point, but I would love it um, if you were able to um, ask questions and we can go from there. Uh, let me see here, man. I have a question for you. Um, what, you said that the, there's not gonna be anything at addressing the 2019 stuff. Um, does that mean that there will, um, I don't know how to put this, that people are gonna work together? Because it seems like the last two sessions, uh, everybody has just, when things got bad, people split and left. And have you seen any, any feelings of that? Or do you think people are actually gonna work together to get stuff done at the state level for all the people? Well, first of all, I feel very lucky to be in the house because I feel like there's more cooperation and working across, you know, basically across the aisle all the time versus you know part of the time. I think that no matter where you are, if you've got a controversial issue, if you're in the House or the Senate, there are times where there simply are disagreements. There may be a continuous goal agreement, but there is not continuous solution agreement. And I also felt that uh, since we've started with this COVID response, uh, basically four to five days after we got out of session that both the leadership across the legislature as well as the governor have worked well together as far as listening to each other. I think one example of that is the COVID response committee that we put together that came up with 15 proposals that the governor has actually used for the foundation of many of the executive orders that she has put out on COVID response. And whether it be uh, closing the schools or uh, whether it was dealing uh, with staying at home, uh, it doesn't matter. There was a lot of response that uh, came from some of that work on the COVID legislative committee that was done remotely. And that had senators and it had house members. It was a joint committee. It had Republicans and independents and uh, Democrats. And I felt that it was a very uh, cohesive group and I spent at least, I, I listened to at least 80% of those meetings, which was about a total of 16 hours. And so I really do feel that I can answer your question with an affirmative, that people are working along uh, together. There will be some differences opinions on, again, a solution. But one example of reopening that again shows this cooperation is the fact that the governor's office, the legislative leadership, as well as uh, folks from different districts that are really concerned. We haven't had any cases, they say. We haven't had any deaths. We think we can open and, and make your, your uh, scale of solutions for testing and your solutions for uh, tracing the illness when we do have spikes and when we do have outbreaks. Uh, we've also worked really well with OHA and the medical community, not just on PPE, but also uh, with our counties um, and working together on trying to figure out response for homeless. Washington County has been an excellent example of a county and a health uh, organization at the county level that's working excellently. We have mayors and legislators at least once a week with the county and the, the health folks on board uh, for questions and for sharing. That was a long answer. I, but I just, it's important to me for you to know that I think folks working together is something that is happening. Well, that's good to hear because it definitely doesn't feel that way on a federal level, um, yeah. but it feels that way at a, definitely at a local level. And, and, and you know, 
politics aside, I think we've actually had some decent leadership from the state. Um, I think you at, froze at the top. There you go. Can you hear me now? No, I can hear you. Uh, yeah, I was just saying that uh, on a federal level, we haven't had the greatest leadership, but you know, as it gets down lower and lower, it seems to be doing better and better. So, um, there was a question in the chat. I think it was from, is that from you, Annette? Uh, it says, um, uh, you had mentioned that the state had 32 million in support, of which 10 million was uh, for small business. What was the other 22 million earmarked for? Oh, okay. I've got that actually right here on a list. So let me just see if I can pull that up. Um, well, basically, there are quite a few different things that we covered. Uh, please remember that in March, we had, um, we had all of the UMQA flooding. And so we, we, sent some, we sent 10 million over there in March. We also um, basically sent 5 million uh, to OHA for helping with COVID response. And that was early March. Um, we worked on domestic violence housing support for uh, 2 million. The long-term care worker training and testing was 3.35 million. We also put out safe shelter and rent assistance for 12 million. And then I think I gave you the other 20. But I can get a list of that or I can actually send something to whoever you know, requested that. Uh, probably if you just send it to Deanna, she can get it out to the membership would probably be the best way to, sure. to distribute it. Absolutely. I have a question, Representative McLean. Thank you for being here today. We really appreciate that. Um, there's been some discussion about um, the cat tax and delaying the cat tax and the impact on businesses. Um, I know that there's been um, some resistance back from the governor on that. And I understand the reasoning why is that it's an, it's an indicator or it's a revenue stream for, for education. I get that. And it's very important, I think, to all of us. Uh, on the other side of the coin, there's businesses and a lot of businesses. I think about our business at Baker Rock Resources. I mean, there's tens of thousands of dollars that we have to pay in this first quarter. We're a small business, 130 people. That's money that we could be using to make payroll, to pay people, to keep people working in the interim in exchange for some delay with that. Mm -hmm. um, because at the end of the day, it seems like the more we can keep people working, the better job we can do downstream with helping fill the gap in the need for revenue for education. So it's kind of a, a catch 22, I get it, but I think a lot of businesses are being faced with, with exactly that and even worse of, of just keeping the lights on and being able to operate. And, and somehow, even if they didn't make a profit um, in this first quarter, they're having to still pay a cat tax. And, and there's a lot of businesses that are having to pay it. So. Any feedback on that at all, uh, what, your, what your thoughts are? Well, I can tell you what I'm hearing and what I've heard the, um, I guess I would say the, the debate it still is. I feel that from the governor's office and from the COVID um, response legislative committee, what I heard was that there was a, a deep desire to make sure that number one, short term, we figure out how to make sure that we make it as easy as possible for the tax to be paid when people can pay it. And so the governor's office and the, the actual committee worked with the Department of Revenue to make sure that um, the quarterly response, so like if you had to pay less than, I think it was five, $5,000 as a base, you didn't have to pay it you know, you had, you didn't have to pay it anything below that in a quarterly way. They raised that bottom line to 10,000. And then they also had the revenue um, department and agency basically look at what was the inner workings of the cat tax when there was a downturn, you know, in the economy. And so um, they realized that both in administrative rule and also in the actual language of the bill, that it was very apparent that if you don't meet, you know, the, the criteria, which is a million dollars, that that you don't have to pay it, you know, in a, in a current way or for a current profit or and or expenses. And so there, they were really looking, I think, at the uh, what I would call the um, the 
nuts and bolts of exactly what the bill was and what it said and what it wasn't. And one of the things that they reported back to the committee was that it was an actual tax that was really, really geared uh, to help businesses when the economy went down. So that was, I would say, probably took about two to three weeks worth of conversation uh, between the committee and the leadership and the governor's office. I think that um, they also, the governor has put out uh, guidance that basically indicates that they're not going to forgive the cat tax at this point, but they understand and the revenue department has been told to work with, with, you know, with businesses on a one-on-one -on -one basis to uh, make it so that they don't have to pay it. Uh, it may be due currently, but that they'll work with them on, on how that works. Now, do I think it can go further than that? Uh, at this point, I do not and have not seen any specific, I guess I would call effort uh, by the leadership or the, the legislature as individuals because we're not in the process yet of actually putting that special session together uh, in a way where we're actually doing the agenda or specifically what the bills and or areas are that will cover. And that's still under negotiation. But I would say that at this point, it's not off the table because it was on, you know, it was definitely on the agenda that was covered by the, the COVID uh, legislative committee. That was a long sort of detailed question with no real answer, right? But um, I think specifically what I want to say is it's certainly still a active topic of discussion. Does that answer your question, Keith? Yeah, I think it did. I think um, I think it as much as information as as you can provide. I think it. I know we're all in uncharted ground here, right? I mean, I think that that's. I mean, none of us have seen it before. We're all trying to figure it out as we go along. I would just suggest that you know I've talked to a lot of business people mostly via Zoom uh, the last couple of weeks. And I know that there are a lot of them that are being impacted and, and really dealing with a tough choice of having to pay this tax. And it would seem to me that it would make better sense. And I understand what we were trying to do by having the, the gradual um, deference at the lower mm -hmm. level. Let's just defer, but really what would work best for business at every level, because there's so many different unique, mm -hmm. you know, impacts to businesses our business has been deemed essential so we can we're lucky enough we've been able to continue to operate but another business maybe can't and and even though that you know who knows what their circumstances are or are not and mm -hmm. it would seem to me that the best way to attack that would to be just to apply some level of deferral to it until we can have a better clear path and and if there would be anything that i can encourage you and your colleagues to encourage the governor as we did exactly that. That would be my suggestion. Well, I appreciate your comments and I, I want you to know that I will be active in that discussion. And I, I'm going to, I do a newsletter. We've got about 4,000 folks on it and I don't know if the, the chamber has shared my newsletter, but it's easy to get on if you go onto the, you can tell me you want to be on it and I'll give it to you. But we will, we're trying to put as many updates and I will put the cat tax uh, information on uh, one of my future, you know, newsletters. And if you want that, or I can send it to Deanna and she can get it out to you guys. And so I'll put her on my, my list to get that done. Uh, we are, we're hearing from small businesses and large businesses alike uh, that there are different elements of that cat tax that concern them. The smaller, when I'm talking smaller, I'm still not talking below you know, a million uh, dollars for the threshold. But um, I will take all your comments and, and try and see what we can do as far as further conversation. Thank you. Uh, it looks like we have another um, question on the chat from Abby. It says, has there been any more discussions of rent freeze or assistance for business owners? Can you repeat that? I couldn't hear it. You, you, you freeze once in a while. Okay. Uh, it says, has there been any more discussion of a rent freeze or assistance for business owners? Well, we did put, um, we did, there has been some work on both rental uh, assistance and 
you know, and mortgage assistance. Some of this has been done by cities, some by counties, and some by executive order from the governor. And basically it was, you know, helping with the credit unions and with the banks, um, really having a plan in place to support both individuals with their rent and uh, owners with their mortgages as they are, you know, working on uh, some of these COVID issues as they're have fallen out in the last two months. Uh, I can't give you, it's Abby, I can't give you any specific um, legislation other than what I've already mentioned from the emergency board, but I know that there's going to be more of that type of response in the special session. Our biggest problem right now, as you guys have figured out with everybody else, you've probably invited to one of these, and that is right now the counties, the cities, and the state are trying to figure out where the gaps are in the CARES Act from the federal level. And we are trying to make sure that we spend our dollars, which as Deanna said um, before she left, you know, are, are, it's like shaking the piggy bank, that uh, basically we put all of our very, very um, scarce resources to the places where the CARES Act isn't doing anything. And so um, right now we are working again on trying to make sure that short term we're helping business, we're helping the, the owners of um, properties, we're helping the renters uh, in their, their rent uh, assistance so that they can just navigate everyday life and continue to go forward and try to figure out how to remake themselves and how to remake their businesses. But I would tell you that that uh, absolutely is uh, part of the agenda for why we would hold a special session. The special session's main focus is going to be budget. We have to, as you know, we don't get to be making money at night like the federal government, thank God, can do. Uh, we have to balance our checkbook by the end of the year. And so uh, we will be working on specifically trying to um, balance our own budgets. And as you know, um, the governor has asked, and these lists will come out today if they haven't already, because I've been on meetings for two hours, but um, their agencies have had a 17% cut in all agency work at the state level. They've been asked by the governor to give their plan for a 17% cut. It's actually an 8.5% cut, but it's in the last year of the cycle, so it, it ends up really having the effect of about you know 17%. That will come out today. And I'm on, I'm also a co-chair of the budget education committee. And I'm also on three infrastructure transportation committees, including the joint transportation committee, the I-5 bridge committee, and uh, two or three other education and transportation committees. And so we will be, the legislature will be taking what the governor has requested of our agencies uh, both in their own budget cuts, but then also in finding these gaps for the uh, Federal CARES Act that we will be receiving. We're trying to make sure that that money gets to the cities, to the counties, and to state budgets and make sure that our essential services are covered. And, you know, there's a list of essential services that constitutionally we're, we are responsible for. Example would be education in the state of Oregon. And then we will turn to the next level of things that we have to do that are not constitutionally um, initiated. And Abby, that was kind of a, a long answer, but yes was the basic answer. And the complicated answer is that that includes both state and federal funding that we have to navigate. So I'd just like to piggyback on that because we were in the property management business and um you know we are a small business as well and and we rely on rents to operate and the assumption is that okay if we do a rent moratorium we'll just do a mortgage moratorium well mortgages are not a they're not our largest overhead expense labor is and we still are required to provide the service regardless of revenue so we're different from other small businesses, whereas a restaurant, if they don't have the, the revenue, they can close their doors. We can't close our doors. We still have to provide housing. That's, that's a, you know, we have to maintain it. We have to provide the basic services, which is expensive. And so from our standpoint, and we totally understand that people 
can't make their rent payments or are having trouble making full rent payments and we work with people, but it would be better on the aid level to not do a rent moratorium and it would be better to provide some sort of rent stimulus because that is, it's the opposite of the old Reaganomics trickle down economics, it's trickle up economics. Whereas if a tenant can make their payment to the landlord, then the landlord can continue to employ the people and then their, their employees can continue to feed the economy. So um, the rent, um, I, I would just like to, if, if you could pass that on, that, the, that a rent stimulus would be much more beneficial in the long term. And also if the governor could, or the state could come out with clarifications, I know they have said that it's, it's a, if you can pay your rent, you should pay your rent but there's this underlying assumption that it's a, it's a rent, I don't have to pay it even if I can. So if that, if that could be voiced more, that would be greatly appreciated. Well, I really appreciate the comments you just made and I really wanna talk maybe more offline about that. I do think that the $10 million that we passed out from the emergency board, we gave to foundations and community, like community action and it's given to them to pay their rents, right? That's what that particular 10 million is. So that, that definitely follows your style and your example there. Uh, I really will, I want to pass on the right message. So maybe you and I can, or you can send me an email that gives me the right words to make sure that it is really responding to some of the, the management uh, folks like yourself that you're talking about because maybe your renters are not the folks that could get that community action dollar. So how do we create or how do we, how do we um, balance, you know, any future uh, rent stimulus that you're calling it um, to actually make the rent get to you? I, I just need a little bit more guidance there on how to pass that up. Would that be okay? Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, we're, and we, have, we work with community action. I mean, okay. you know, and it's not, you know, we're a small business. We're we're just trying to stay afloat. We're not we're not the stereotypical Mr. Monopoly with the top hat and the monocle that's right. throwing people on the street. You know, we just want we just want to do what's fair. But, you know, our hands are kind of tied a little bit differently. I mean, every industry has their own quirk, but uh, you know, we have a, a very weird quirk in this in this time. Can I ask you, as far as the federal uh, response now, as you described some of that, since labor's one of your costs. Um, were you able to get the payroll, you know, yeah. we were, we, we got the PPP on the second round. Um, and at, at the time we applied, you know, we applied in the first round and we didn't think we would need it um, because rents came in last month really well. This month they're dropped, you know, at a, not alarming, but they're definitely noticeable and we're really worried about next month. So, you know, we got the PPP as a, safety valve and I think you know I, we're if the trend is from last month to this month continues to next month and the month after it's a good thing we got it so okay that helps me because they, those two really connect right in some right. way right so yeah. I can yeah that helps yep can I speak a little bit to that because um, I own a business with just 10 employees and we are personal care services. We do massage and facials. And, and is it heavy? Yes. Okay. And we did not qualify for the EIDL, but we did get the PPP and even the paperwork on that said it would be deposited with, within 10 business days. And then the timer would start, but it was actually deposited the same day and we are not open yet. So we, I just feel like we've kind of gotten um, kind of messed up on that <laughs> uh, because I, I just don't, I don't know what to do but rather than, you know, I can't use 75% for people that I don't have. Um, and a, a lot of them won't come back at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and even if we reopen, if we're approved for the 15th to reopen, a lot of them are not comfortable coming back. So. I'm just kind of at a loss of what to do. Do I take this loan and make it um, and pay my rent with it? Because I know, you know, just as Brad was saying, they need their money too. Mm -hmm. Or do I figure that out with on the employee side? So I'm just at a loss. Like, I, I feel like we're one of the businesses that fell through the cracks um, and, and didn't get the, the help as I, I thought it was intended. Well, what you just said was really important. Can I, can you tell me again what your business was? 
So we're personal care services. We do um, massage and uh, and facials. So. All right, I, I agree with you that it's very complicated to try and figure out how to fit into a program and then make it so that it works with the, the current um, circumstances that you find yourself in. Now, are you here in, in uh, Washington County? Yes. Okay, and so, you know, we have the biggest challenge of all uh, because Washington County, Multnomah County, Clackamas County, and possibly, um, it might be the northern coast, the very, very uh, top county in northern coast. What is that? Why am I forgetting that today? Astoria is in what county? That's Clatsop County, isn't it? Clatsop yeah. County. So um, anyway, to me, those are the four or five counties that, that basically are having the hardest time because of the, the guidelines that have come out and the EOs from the, the office of the governor. And Abby, I absolutely agree with you. You know, you have the, the support to be able to pay folks, but you can't open your doors. And so I think that is specifically what the legislature is trying to encourage the governor and ourselves on how to get that to happen as quickly as possible. And it feels like we're, you know, we're trotting through quicksand and, you know, mud. And I absolutely agree with you. And, and your area, to be on, honest, has been the one where we've had the most emails back from your workers and you're absolutely right we have you know we have email on one side from the business saying we want to open and we want to open now and we have so many folks that dental hygienists massage therapists um, hairdressers uh, nail uh, techs all of those folks are saying we don't want to go back to work because we don't think it's safe and so then we're navigating that with OA, OHA and also with other medical teams that the governor's office has as set up as the experts to run through some of this guidance that's going out. I don't have an easy answer for you, but I will tell you that uh, you are on the top of the list as far as guidance uh, concerns and people spending more time and energy from the governor's office, OHA, and everybody else right now and trying to figure that out. And again, my newsletter is where we're putting out as much of that as we can. And one of the things that my newsletter has, and also you can go on my, my legislative website, we have a list of links. And the list of links, uh, we're gonna try and add today the guidance links if we haven't gotten them on the newsletter and on the legislative site. But we're trying to, to get the links so that you can go to that Abby and and maybe you can find those guidance and then maybe you can give me input and then I can pass that on because we have daily calls with OHA. And so I pass on anything you as a business owner thinks is a better guideline for getting your doors open quicker, but also keep your workers and your customers safe. And thank you for that, that comment. I really appreciate that. And I'm taking notes to, to go back with some of the elevated uh, emails that we send up to the governor's office and also to the economic um, executive committee that's meeting with the governor. Got one. Okay, go ahead, Josh. Um, uh, Representative McLean, again, thanks for, for being here. Um, so our public policy committee, um, of which a few people in the virtual room here are, are members of or have been in the past, not only sets, you know, like legislative priorities and stuff for the chamber, but also kind of acts grassroots uh, style when we can. Is there a best way to have people sort of funnel feedback or information. I know it's a Pandora's box when you say, come talk to us about stuff because yeah. it can get wild, especially now. But is there, a, is there a best way to do that that I could pass along maybe? Well, I have to be honest, you know, and with this uh, COVID, I, I think we're all doing business a little differently. And I know that in the first two weeks of, of March and the third week of March, my staff and I were working eight to 11 hours a day just answering emails. And I have sure. to be honest with you, that's the best way because we go through our email list every single day. I go through it Saturday and Sunday so we can keep up uh, on Monday. And uh, we really try, you can, you're always welcome to call me. I, you can have my cell phone, you can text me. You, but to be honest with you, we have a system with our email and our email turnaround is no more than about two and a half, three days. And so we, and we elevate every single day to each one of the different committees that the governor's using. 
and you know we've got regional solutions connections which you guys do too but we also when we pull that up if a, if a legislator pulls it up to the regional solutions team you pull it up to the regional solutions team it gets more airtime and uh, we we elevate to OHA we elevate um, to our transportation infrastructure I carry those messages to any of our agencies um, that it applies to so really and truly I need it in writing because when I have it in writing then I can pass it on and I can send up 15 emails or right now of course unemployment insurance you know we have been spending I, I call people on Sunday uh, to try and get more information so we can elevate we're supposed to batch our unemployment insurance requests and or concerns or problem cases um, it, it doesn't matter if it's the CARES Act or if it's a state unemployment or anything else we need it in writing and uh, trying to convince people that you know talk and and I do try to make personal phone calls back to citizens that are totally in distress but um, please use my email my official email helps me get it through the system in a really effective way I've got two people from the governor's office and one of them I know because they were a former student in the Washington County area but we get such good response you cannot believe offices other offices honestly don't believe um, the good kind of response that we're getting but it's because we're doing it in writing and we're not just calling and you know complaining to this or that person so. That's Thank great. Thank you. So I have another question. Um, I think it was in our public policy meeting. Um, it had come up that grants can be a taxable um, event. So is there any way the state or you could pass that on to the state if you're receiving especially a grant for an emergency COVID type situation that the state's not taking their share of that grant as a tax and income tax in the future? Okay, so now I'm going to have a COVID moment. This is what I call my COVID moments. I've been in so many different meetings. I thought we took care of that. So let me, I'm writing that down as another one. We, we work both with cities and with counties and with states, with the state uh, work, trying to make sure that it's not taxable, that the okay. grant not taxable. And it, it's possible that that has happened already and I missed it, so. No, I, I mean, I've got to check it because like I said, I'm having a COVID minute, a moment. It truly, I mean, you're in so many meetings, you think you've talked about it, you've answered it, you've elevated it, it's changed, but let me check that out. And again, that's something that I need to get back to Deanna so she can get back to you. Okay. But I absolutely, have, have, I agree with your position. I have a question. Um, if well first off i would encourage you please uh, i i think that a lot of folks have been uh hoping for special session and for some action out of the legislature sooner rather than later mm -hmm. now i appreciate your comments um susan i really really do and i i get it that you're trying to get things in line mm -hmm. um on the other side of the coin, I mean, the clock is ticking, and and so the sooner the better. So that would be, I'll just kind of leave that one there. And I think you understand my tone there, please. Mm -hmm. um, is there any discussion or any opportunity? I know you you work a lot on transportation. Is there any way to accelerate any transportation investment at the state level as we talk about economic recovery? Because you know, usually and typically, um, infrastructure investment has been. Uh, a prime catalyst for economic recovery. And is there any way to kind of accelerate that? I know in, in some of the talks I've been in with ODOT, they're not expecting, given the size and magnitude of their budget, they're not expecting too big of a hiccup through this downturn, mm -hmm. at least right now, the picture. But is there any way to do anything additionally there to, to help economic recovery? So I want to talk about your first comment first. Um, the legislature has been ready to go in special session at least twice, okay? And so we're not dealing only with wanting to have everything in line. There is a, you know, there's always a relationship between the governor's office and ourselves, and we have to honor her executive order potential and honor when uh, we should have that special session. If she calls us in, we can only have one uh, special session per emergency. And the timing would, would cost a great deal of money because we would be in session until somebody did. I mean, it would be very difficult to close the session off. 
unless we agreed to a one day session or three day session, a week session, whatever. So those are some of the issues on that. If we call ourselves in, that's also another issue with some constitutional things. So there are some technical things that we've got to, to get through, but we're ready. You know, we want to go. We do have priorities. The committee will uh, solidify specifically anything else that hasn't been agreed to, but we're working hard on that. Now to infrastructure, I spend, you know, at least 50% of my day on infrastructure every day. And uh, I want to make sure that we get a bill, uh, you know, a bridge built across the Columbia this time and not have another 12 year experience. Um, we have uh, quite a lot of work to do for everyone, including uh, Washington, Oregon, and California, as far as, as our infrastructure for freight and for mobility and uh, congestion relief on I-5 so that we can do our business well and be part of the West Coast uh, system. And so we're working really hard on making sure that the projects from our 2017 a transportation package can actually get built and get finished. Uh, we're working diligently on that. We, I, I'm now the co-chair also of the Joint uh, Transportation Committee, and one of the meetings that we'll be having here in the early June is that meeting. And we are going to be having an update on the fuel tax and on the highway trust fund and on uh, possible revenue streams that will replace the fuel tax when that fuel tax is not adequate. And uh, we will work through uh, those updates and those reports here very quickly within the next two to three weeks. Uh, I am committed other, you know, there's not another subject area besides education that I am committed to because I think it helps business, it helps communities and it helps everyone with their lifestyles and, and uh, just health. Uh, to make sure that our infrastructure is balanced and it's updated and it's maintained and that we have future uh, modes of transportation potential because we have not put up barriers. So that is a place where I spend an awful lot of my energy and my time and my commitment. So um, I'll be there working to speak to that and uh, anything that again you want to send to me in written form is always uh, appreciated because it helps me again uh, talk to the governor, talk to the leadership. I'm, I have a work plan that uh, was turned in on Monday and I'm meeting with my leadership uh, tomorrow um, remotely uh, and uh, we'll be uh, talking to her about the things that I absolutely think have to be done as we come out of the COVID response and go into 2021. Thank you. Uh, I've got a question more on a, uh, it's less business, it's more personal related of, I have a uh, high school age kid and a senior that's graduating that's gonna be a college kid next year. And you're seeing kind of varied responses from the different state universities of we're gonna be open, we're trying to be open, we don't know if we're gonna be open. Is there a coordinated effort at the state level to set guidelines for housing classes, that kind of stuff? Or is it all just kind of, let's try and put out the biggest fire right now and deal with that in as we can. That's an excellent question and uh, just spent the last three days talking um, to folks about that. First of all, um, a group or agency that we call HEC, H-E-C-C, which is the Higher um, Coordinating Committee for uh, Institutions in the State of Oregon, uh, they have a relationship with all of the universities and the community colleges. And so they do set out guidelines and they do set out guidelines for curriculum. They set out guidelines for um, different types of classes and transfer uh, credits and all of those types of things. And they um, basically report to my subcommittee on education for the budget. And so uh, all of those types of things are happening all the time, not just with COVID response. Uh, we also, uh, Right now, uh, I've been talking, we had a, a actually Janine Salmon and I had a student speak where we had students from uh, the Hillsborough School District come and talk to us about issues with COVID. And uh, one of the issues that we talked to them about was what were their plans for next year. And so when I heard this, then I, I started talking to universities because they said, if it's going to be um, 
e-distance learning for my university classes. I'm staying home and going to PCC and I'm going to make sure that it costs me less. And so um, there's that attitude out there that is very local as well as statewide and national because I've checked on it and read some articles on it. And so we're saying to the universities, you know, and to community colleges, what are your plans, you know, and what are your plans A, B, and C for budget? Because we know you're waiting for a little bit of state budget because remember they've got, especially community colleges have a wide variety of, of resources that are not just uh, state budget. And so they are right now, I just talked to Oregon State University yesterday and we had a, a Zoom meeting and right now they are working on plans for opening up their physical campus. They are looking at how to deal with both um, their dining room, their, um, their dorm rooms and dealing with having facilities where if they were going to have 100 people in a classroom, they might only have 50 people in the classroom, which means that their capacity is going to be changed. And they're going to have to deal with lower, you know, tuition. And they are, they have made a commitment, at least at Oregon State, not to raise their, uh, their tuition uh, for everybody who has been in class. So that means your sophomores, juniors, and seniors. And they're looking and working through how they're going to maintain that for freshmen, uh, if at all possible. So they're working for, through a wide variety of issues from tuition to class structure, um, on-site classes. And they have actually, Oregon State says that their uh, e-distance learning has actually gone quite well. And I have a grandson who is there as a junior who is doing the e-distancing classes from Oregon State. And he's pleased enough with it that he's definitely, whether they're open or not, he will continue on there uh, as a junior senior. And uh, so there's a wide variety of issues there. We are working with HEC and with the Oregon Department of Education to really try to step up um, their, I guess I would call it framework, because remember that, that uh, when they, we went away from a state board for our institutions and each one of the universities have their own board, that's caused our relationship at the state to be different. And that's been in place for the, the entire time that I've been at, at the state legislature. So there's, there's really tricky relationships because some of it are board decisions and they just simply go along with us when they want more budget, right? Because we don't, we don't have that higher board of education uh, opportunity anymore. So we're working as hard as we can on it. It's definitely my wheelhouse because that's, those are the folks that I deal with, with, with budget. And uh, well, I'm going to be talking to the University of Oregon and also a couple of community colleges in the next two days. So I, I try to put some of that information in my newsletter as well. But I'm happy personally, if you want uh, any information, let me know, call me and I'll give you my cell phone before I get off the phone because everybody has it. It's the only phone I've got. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, does anybody else have any questions? That's something that's not very policy heavy or anything, but um, how are you finding you and your colleagues being able to adapt to all this? and? Are, are you still connecting as much as you would hope during these kind of things? Is it getting better? Are there any takeaways for the future of how right. kind of we're all going to operate differently? Right. I mean, at least for the foreseeable future, maybe longer. Well, I have to be honest. I was extremely uncomfortable at the beginning with all of the Zoom and Microsoft's uh, soft, what is it, Microsoft Teams and you know some of the other ways that we were having to communicate with you know online i i'm a speech and debate coach and teacher by you know by profession and it was really difficult to have people jumping off and on you know having people i could see and people i couldn't see having people you know freeze i mean it, it didn't the flow of the meetings didn't feel comfortable and i don't know if you guys have found that but i and i was spending some times from 8.30 until 5.30 online a day. The first three weeks were just incredible. And after that, we've tried to, you know, to cut down to being able to have only four to five hours of meetings on, you know, online daily, and then have time to work online ourselves and be able to get everything done. I've got a staff member that, you know, is on Barber Boulevard and, 
you know, she and I, you know, are online together at least twice a day for half an hour. And then we're working separately. We're texting each other all the time. So, you know, it logistically, it's gotten smoother, but it was pretty, pretty hard. Um, I find that the legislators, of course, because of what we call quorum issues, we cannot meet, you know, just all of us at one time. And so um, we can't, we can't have committee meetings on unless they're on Zoom or they're on Microsoft uh, team and we've got a way for the public to be involved. That's been tricky. And that's what our staff has been working on to make it so that the meetings can happen on May 22nd to July or June 5th. And so, you know, personally, I, I feel like, you know, it's doable and hey, there are some people that like these Zoom meetings. I don't get it, but they do. Janine's one of them, for gosh sake. She's always wanted me to have a Zoom meeting. And it's one of those things that we're just, we're trying to figure out how to utilize the technology in the future. And being on transportation, I've been dealing with autonomous vehicles for like four or five years. And it's a situation now where somebody wants me to look at robots and they're traveling up to the doorway, you know, with packages. And they're doing that in Seattle and they want to bring that to Oregon. So I, I'm not anti you know, tech. I just want to be able to be able to really have a personal feeling that I'm getting to you or you're getting to me or we're understanding each other. Yeah, it's interesting about quorum and just, you know, I assume emergency or special session will be virtual as well. Yeah. Well, I don't know. There, um, we, we have a constitutional issue in the sense that we have to be there to vote. And so there, there, that's another reason why it depends on who brings us in. But we're, it says in the Constitution we have to be present to vote. So we've thought about all of us being in our offices and that we could have the debate because we've got a, a monitor in our office. And then we'd have to go down in groups of five, you know, to vote at our desk. Yeah. So, you know, we'll have to figure that out. Strange new world. Strange new world. So I got one. Uh, we're we have it looks like it's eleven thirty eight. We go to eleven forty five. We'll get out, get you out of here right at at eleven forty five if we can. Um, I just had a quick question. Um, I was on a call this morning uh, through the chamber, and there was a mention of the there's four or five states grouping together to ask the federal government for funding. Yeah. Um, could you just give a brief of what that is, what the funding would go for and what those five, who those states are? Right. Uh, we've got Washington, Oregon, California, Nevada, and Colorado. And those five states have kind of made what we call the Western State Pack. And we've done this on a number of different issues, including opening. It's not that our opening um, guidelines are going to necessarily be lock stack. They're not, they're gonna be different, but we have the same values. And so we're trying to make sure that is, as businesses, you know, interstate uh, commerce, as they go from state to state, that they're really not dealing with such different states that they can't get their products to where they need it to go, to markets in different uh, parts or different regions or different states. And so what we did ask the federal government, there was a letter that went from the governor's office, as well as all those legislators and all those presiding officers from those five states asking for more money that can be used for state and the cities and counties and locally, you know, to get back on our feet. And so um, we we think that you know the 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 kind of group that we've put together gives the federal government a real feel for the fact that you know we're we're gonna do things on our own as much as we can, but they've got some responsibility and we're not talking about a single state. We're not talking about states with uh, low case counts or high case counts that really we're talking about enterprising, um, you know, our economic issues and that we're really, because we feel like the federal government's reacting right now to, like you said, the economic stimulus. And, you know, I didn't say, Josh, in my long, windy answer that um, on transportation, what, what I'm trying to do is make sure that we've got everybody in the state ready for an infrastructure, infrastructure package if we get one. 
And so we're trying to make, you know, our projects, our infrastructure, whether it be broadband or replacement of the I-5 bridge or anything else, that we're ready to go and that our projects look like the projects they want to fund. Any last last questions before we wrap up? Okay. I would just make one comment and that is that this has really been helpful and I hope that you'll invite me to a few more uh, and I'd be happy to, um, to assist. I have a, a short list of uh, comments that you made that I will try to, if there were answers that were necessary, try to get to Deanna, but please okay. remember um, I'm happy to get to you on a phone call or have you sign up for the newsletter to get things on a more regular basis. And the newsletter, we can just go to your legislative website and, and sign in there, correct? Absolutely. Okay. Okay. I, I greatly appreciate it. Um, we do do these, sir, this is a the Small Business Solutions Series, it's kind of a tongue twister, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday at 10 o'clock. Um, and tomorrow, Keith, who's on this call, is doing a presentation on um, uh, best practices for operating uh, as a business that was a deemed essential and has operated completely through this, uh, hopefully giving pointers to businesses that are going to reopen on things that they've tried that have worked and things that maybe haven't worked. So, um, And is yours construction, Keith? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're highway construction and, oh, and great. Okay. construction. Well, is everybody invited, Brad? I mean, yeah. Um, and I can um, have Deanna send you the link um, to the Zoom call. It's open to anybody and everybody. Um, well, what I wanted to say is my meetings, you know, go on and on, but I have a wonderful staff member named Claire that I would love to have so we don't have to go back and view the tape because yeah. I don't like the way Zoom tapes. It's yeah. the way they tape. Ugh. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and it, um, yeah, if you spread the word, I mean, the more the merrier. I mean, we've okay. had anywhere from, you know, this is, uh, I would say on the, about the average, you know, anywhere from eight to 15 is kind of the average, but we've had upwards of 60 to 70 people on certain calls for certain topics. So, um, it, you know, and we're always open for ideas of what people want to hear about. Um, so we can get our quote unquote experts or just people that, you know, are willing to share. So. Well, I appreciate it and thank you. Yep.